Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic, and we're coming up on one year. I'm going to check the dates and find out what day is exactly a year, and then we'll do something special on that webinar. Today, my guest is Martina Neerthart, and she is a veterinarian who's currently living in Switzerland doing rehab over there. Hi, Martina. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, everyone. Victor, are, Martina, are you a native of Switzerland? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm born here. Born and bred since several generations. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Like, so my stubbornness. <laughs> for, for my guests that don't know you, can you just give us a, a little bit about your background? Yes, I, I'm like Wendy said, a veterinarian from Switzerland. I'm a specialized. I have my own practice for rehab and alternative medicine. So that means I'm doing a lot of rehab stuff. Um, podiatry is one of my um, big things I love to do. I work together with quite a few farriers. Um, I'm doing all the um, alternative or additional medicine stuff you can do. I have the honor to work together with a few good clinics that do the normal sport medicine part. So I can actually concentrate on the other things like acupuncture, chiropractic, myofascial release, um, taping, all the stuff that you need. You gonna then that you need for um, that you would need for rehabilitation. So that's what I love, and that's what we're gonna talk today about. Awesome. How long have you been doing rehab? Uh, since two thousand um, six. And it's um, really start. People are finally realizing that that horses are athletes and they need sports medicine and rehabilitation just like human athletes. Yeah, that's also when you do now your um, board certification in sports medicine and rehab. It is together. It's one um, board certification. Uh, you can then choose if you want to have your focus on the sports medicine or if you want to have it on the rehab. And um, so I, I like rehabilitation better. So I let others do the sport medicine part. <laughs> and, and could you just kind of explain a little bit the difference between the two for those who aren't quite sure? Yeah, I mean, rehabilitation is everything that comes to get the athlete back after the injury. Um, the sports medicine part that goes a little bit into the rehab part is the diagnostics. So all the diagnostics like lameness evaluation, the nerve blocks you do, and then the ultrasound and the x-ray study you do. And especially then what's the main focus is the operations that are part of it. So, or if you inject tendons with something special or all that, this is part of sport medicine. So everything that has to do with lameness and getting them better, this is sports medicine. Okay, and then the rehab side. The rehab side is that what comes afterwards. In the rehab side, we have similar things like you do ultrasound to um, follow progression. For example, after a tendon injury or x-rays that you follow after um, an initial fracture or something like that, or check progression of arthritis or the treatment that you've chosen for it, if that works. So you have these things in there too. And then you have all the different modalities that we can play with, be it acupuncture, be it meso mesotherapy, um, be it um, pulsating magnetic field, laser, um, all the manual therapies that we have, be chiropractic, osteopathy, myofascial release, and how they are all called. I just call them manual therapy because you work with your hands and that's your most important tool. Um, and this is all part of it. So, right. And so it's really, so if I can understand it right, um, sports medicine is sort of pre-injury and rehab is post-injury. Is that kind of? Yes. And also the treatment is part of the sports medicine. Oh, okay. You know, if, if you have like um, a ruptured tendon that it needs to be, um, saw it together or if you have a serious joint inf infection and it needs the treatment there or an inflammation and you inject the joints this is part of sports medicine okay so it's after they've treated whatever and then it the horse needs to be rehabilitated so it gets back to good function that's 
what you focus on primarily. Yeah. Like I said, you still need to be able to see is the lameness there? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? So it is really a combination that has a lot of overlapping. That's why it is one board certification. And you can focus on what um, interests you the most or, or what your heart loves the most and, and do that then. Awesome. All right. So very well, that helps me understand this a little bit better. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So you have a presentation for us today? Yes. Basic rehabilitation. Awesome. So can I should be able to share? share? Little green button at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. I uh, hope it's working. Yep. yep. Here we go. It's working. Here we are. Oops. Oops. It's okay. Okay. So our topic today is rehabilitation of the equine patient. And we're going to do just a short introduction. So we're going to skip some things or just graze on them shortly. What I'm going to do a little bit more in depth is um, tendon injuries because they are quite common and something where the sure foot pads can be used quite well for that. Um, tendon injuries in sport horses depend a little bit, like for example, in race horses, depending on the track here in Europe and America, we have between um, 16 and 30% of horses out of 100 that come out, up with a tendon injury post race. So this is something that is very common. Um, for example, in, in Japan, where racing is also very big and Singapore, they have over 44% tendon injuries wow. um, because of how they keep the horses. Uh, it's short bouts of work and long waiting periods in the box. So box rest, like we see now, is not very beneficial, but we're gonna go into deeper um, with that one. So what do we have to take into consideration? Um, why is rehabilitation important? Um, structures heal best when they move in a controlled way. So if we just keep the horse standing there, um, it's losing function of joints, ligaments get weaker, bones get weaker. Um, we talk about that a little bit more in detail. So keep everything moving is very, very important for a healthy body. 80% of the stability of the body comes from muscle. I mean, it's, it's not the bones and it's not the tendons and ligaments. They provide just 20% of the stability. So if we have a problem with the muscles, we always gonna have secondary problems on tendons, ligaments, and, um, and bones like joints. You can get joint inflammation from that or tendon ruptures or tendon injuries or stuff like that. Another thing that needs to be taken into consideration is fascia. Fascia is what connects everything and also helps with muscle movement and helps with um, letting blood vessels and nerves and everything go to the muscles, go to the bones and everything. They are the sliding factor that connects everything and provides a big net. Then, uh, like I said, if you do not move a joint for more than 48 hours, we do already have joint cells, chondrocytes that make our cartilage die off and other things that happened in the whole body. But it's just 48 hours till we see pathological changes. Another thing to take really into consideration and what gets often forgotten is the metabolic status of a horse. Does your horse have a subclinical um, Cushing's or um, PPI um, D or, um, yeah, that's Cushing's or um, insulin resistance, or does it have PSSM or is it old and has liver or kidney issues? Um, age itself is just a metabolically challenging thing that we know it ourselves. We heal worse when we get older than when we're young. 
Um, so this is really, really important and needs to be taken into consideration. Then also the foot. Foot balance is critical. Um, from the top down and also from the bottom up, we can't have a horse without a proper foot. And it is really important for rehabilitation because loading changes of the whole structure up top with foot balance. And the loading from up top, if we have compensation, will change how the foot morphs down because the hoof capsule is elastic. So too much pressure will change the shape. And the other way around, if we have like a broken back hoof pass an axis, we're gonna overload certain structures also up top. Then we're gonna talk shortly about different rehabilitation uh, modalities that we can use every day without any problems. Then we're gonna have a short anatomical review of important structures for tendon rehabilitation. We also go quickly through tendons, the difference between them because a tendon is is not a tendon, they're really unique in their composition and what they do. And this is why it's so important to know what tendon is injured when you wanna do rehabilitation. It's really, really important to have a proper diagnosis. And then I give you some little uh, programs that you can look up for the most frequent things that we encounter um, for rehabilitation. I made a short summary about everything that I sent to Wendy, if you're interested, so you can read up everything again. Um, now, muscle rehabilitation. Um, this, like I said, the stabilization of the body structures is 80% from the muscles. So they're very, very important. In muscles, we can find trigger points. That means localized, contractions of muscles. These contractions will cause tension in the muscle. Um, everybody who had that himself knows they lead to uh, referred pain. That means perhaps if you're tight up here, you might get a headache up here. This is so-called referred pain patterns. We know that very well from humans. In animals, they're still studying it, but the same exists. That's also, for example, if you have problems with your hip, you're gonna get back pain. Even if, but the problem is in the hip, but the actual pain you're gonna have is in your back. Or if you wear wrong shoes due to the compensation, your referred pain pattern will be somewhere else and not where the original problem is. Then we have the myofascial lines that we already talked about several times. And I know you had several more um, webinars about that and how they influence posture and also landing, loading of the feet and those compensations pattern that develop out of that. Um, if we have off the words compensation pattern, we do have altered muscle function because the movement pattern changes. If you have, for example, a pebble in your shoe, you start to move differently when you don't take the shoe out. Instead of landing where the pebble is, you land here. And if you do that for 30 minutes, you don't even have to think again to evade ev ev or not stand on where the pebble is. You automatically do it here. And the moment you do it automatically, this is a central movement pattern that got generated. These are, um, how do I say? These are stored in our back. This is a um, reflex. That's not something you know, our brain has to think consciously about continuously. It just happens. If you do a movement several times in a certain way, your body will remember and you don't have to think about it. It generates a movement pattern. Unfortunately, if a horse was sore for a long time, they stay in those central movement patterns and they need relearn that again. Like that's what humans do in logopathy. That's when you learn to relearn movement patterns again. This is also part of rehabilitation. Questions? Not yet. Good. Oh, wrong, sorry. Come on. 
So this is a short um, overview about fascia. Here we see, if you see my little arrow here, we see some of the fascia lines from um, Rick Schultz and Wipke Elrond uh, from the University of Denmark, who did some research on that. This is from 2015 when that came out, just so you know and see how everything is connected. And one of those lines is never acting on itself because if we look over here, you see that everything is connected in a really huge net. Um, these pictures are from um, Gumberto, a French scientist who filmed um, fascia movement under the skin in humans. This, um, this one here, these pictures that we see here is from that part of your body. Um, this is where you get the antitions when you have a carpal tunnel syndrome. That means this tendon here is no longer sliding against that tendon sheath here. Um, here, down here, we just have a bundle of muscles. These little red thingies are muscle fibers that are surrounded by fascia. You can see it's again a net. And you can see here a little nerve that goes in and innervates the muscle. So nerves do run in fascia. This is important because nerves can't stretch. Nerves always lie in an S shape. And then the fascia stretches because fascia can stretch up to 300%. So all the nerve does is from going from an S shape into a straight line. And if the, the tension relaxes in the fascia, it goes back to an S shape. Um, and that wouldn't be able in the muscles because there it, it, it is stuck. And nerves don't like when they're stuck and can't move freely. So. This is what happens when you immobilize a joint. I'm gonna go with you through that. And this is just from one joint, but it has influence on the whole body. This research, I want to point that out, is from 1987. Um, so we know that now about 50 years, 40 to 50 years. And still we have horses kept on box rest for injuries. This is not good, and I'll show you why. So um, basically, this, this paper talks about the effects of uh, immobilizing joints for 48 hours, and basically they found that you're weakening everything when you do that? No, they got yes. it right? Yeah, and the longer it goes on, the worse it is. So if you immobilize a horse in a box for a tendon injury, the whole body is starting to fall apart. You are losing, I'll just point out where those things are when I have my arrow here. You are losing bone mass. You are losing, you are weakening the ligament insertions on the bones. The osteoclastic resorption, that means the bone mass, will um, be increased and you get osteoporosis. So you're even weakening the bone structures. This is why rehabilitation is so important. And after an injury, why, if they have been on box rest, you need to start very slowly if you have them on box rest because the whole body is starting to fall apart. Collagen mass, that's what is the elastic fibers in the tendon, declines by about 10%. And you get an accelerated degeneration um, of that. We have um, collagen crosslinks that increase, that means adhesions, the whole thing, all the tendons and ligaments are no longer so elastic how they used to be because there is more crosslink in there because it's not moving, so it starts to, to stay like that. Um, we have connective tissue building up within the joint space, so even inside the joints, you start to get adhesions. That means it can't move freely anymore. Um, where, it, um, where the joint cartilage, um, because it needs movement to be elastic, cartilage is like a little sponge. It gets compressed and then it goes back up with the movement and soaks in water again and then it gets compressed. If it stays compressed because there is no movement and it touches each other, we're gonna get so-called ulcers 
because the cartilage um, cells start to die if you have cartilage to cartilage contact for longer. And then you get scar tissue in there. Also the ligaments, oh, what happened now? Also the ligaments that are there start to be weakened like the tendons. So everything is starting to fall apart if you do not move the body. Wow. Um, then, like I said, the metabolic status is so important for rehabilitation, especially in older horses. We see that they have a delayed healing. If you then have, in addition, something like insulin resistance, equimetabolic um, syndrome, or subclinical Cushing's, that means they're not really Cushing, but they still have it in their body on a subclinical level. There's always a little bit of inflammation there. And the collagen gets built up as a, as a wrong type, type three instead of, and four instead of type one and two, um, you will not get a proper tissue healing. Also bone healing will be delayed because when we have insulin resistant, we always have a slight inflammation of the blood vessels and stuff like that. So there is always too much inflammation in the body. Active inflammation means that we have um, these cells that eat away um, on the tissue for the healing will always be active. And these should change against the ones that help to, um, to heal again and to build tissue up. But as long as there is an active inflammation, and even if it's just a subclinical one, it will not heal properly. So this is really, really important. If you have healing not going on well, check metabolic status on your horse. The same as if the horse is too fat. Um, if the horse is overweight, it is predisposed for insulin resistance because it has too much leptin. That is a hormone that is in the fat that does um, dysregulate the insulin um, re, um, sensitivity in the body. And in addition, we have extra strain on joints and soft tissue and everything. Then certain medications that we have a very prominent one is bisphosphonates because I know in certain areas, it's very um, common to use osphos or something similar on horses. Um, they will inhibit and prolong reliable bone healing for six to 15 months. Usually a bone is healed in about eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks, we have proper bone healing. If we use bisphosphonates, or bisphosphonates have been used in a horse up to 12 months prior, we will have a delayed bone healing for up to one and a half years, depending on the product that got used. Because you will not get healthy bone tissue and they're very prone to refracture it or the fractures will just not close when you re-X-rays them. Um, there is a... Um, a uh, very good report on that, on a Pollock uh, report that you find several uh, informations about that. The other thing that I want to point out is malnutrition. Malnutrition does not always mean that the horse is too thin. It means that the horse doesn't have certain minerals, amino acids, collagen, protein, vitamins, or, and so on that it needs. It can be there's too much iron in your water and you do not have afterwards because of that enough um, manganese and zinc and copper because it, the body just can't have it. So these are things that are really important or not enough calcium or the calcium phosphorus um, balance is disturbed. This is all malnutrition and it's really, really important for a proper tissue healing that we have a good balanced nutrition. So no foot, no horse. This is a picture that I got the allowance from the equine documentalist to use it. You always have some very nice um, articles and pictures and graphs that he uses. Um, so this horse shows a very marked compensatory stance. It looks like an elephant on a little ball. 
if you look at the base where he stands. So if you look at the base of support for that horse, it's the red one here. Um, in a healthy stance, it would have the feet in front and behind the green line and the verticals like the cannon bone should always be vertical. And then it would be a line here from tuberi ishi down to the hock cannon bones and the hoof would be somewhere here. The same would be here, shoulder, elbow, straight down cannon bones, the feet would be somewhere here. Um, this is really, really important because if a horse is standing like this, it always has to engage muscles. This means we're gonna get a fatigue of the muscles. And this, this horse, if you look at him, he doesn't look happy. He has a hollow back here. You can see that the muscles are very tight here and here. Also the abdominals here engage. You can see there's lots of tension here on this serratus. You can see like how you have a dip and it's leaning forward to take weight off and weight under. Um, so it's really critical for rehabilitation. They're able to stand with equal forces on all four feet. It's a quadruped animal. It should be able to use all his feet if possible. Shoeing and trimming can have an influence and can be a source of a problem or enhance a problem that we have already there. If the um, balance is not right, that means like too long toes or too low heels or inside higher than the outside. So it should be able to bear equally weight on his feet, on all four of them. What is out of the farrier's um, doing is the trimming cycle. A lot of people think it's okay to have eight or 10 weeks in between shoeings. It is not okay because we know from research, Renata Veller and the RVC looked into that very intensely that after a five to six week period, our hoof pass, um, our um, palmar angle and plantar angles sink by about three degrees. So that means because of the loading of the hoof naturally, the heel area grows a little slower than the toe area. And that means the hoof is doing that. And with that, our bone angle is gonna change. That's what you see. And the longer you wait, the longer your toes are gonna be, the more underarms your heels are gonna be, and the more crushed will everything be in the back. And that gives a vicious cycle because they start to be painful on that. So an appropriate cycle is maximum five to seven weeks, depending on the growth. The average is five to six weeks. Sometimes in summer, it can be shorter, or if we have a laminitic pony that really needs to be always perfect, then we might have to do everything every four weeks, something that just depends on the growth and you need to listen to the horse. Move past an angle is something else. This is this line, if we have, a straight line here from the cannon bone, we would we check here from the pastern down to the hoof. This should be a straight line. This one here is massively broken back, as we can see. Same here. To change that, especially in the hinds, horse, because you see first the changes in the hinds if you have that, horses tend, tend to stand under. So they can stretch the, the, the joints a little more when they do that, so they can have a little better alignment. But what it does, it puts a lot of strain on the top here. We know that this kind of stance, and if we have long toe and broken back to fast an angle, we get a lot of problems, not just in the joints here, but we're gonna have suspensory issues. We're gonna have hock problems. We're gonna have stifle problems. We're going to have gluteal pain. We're going to have SA um, inflammation. And we're going to have tension and pain in the back area. And this is all proven in the last 10 years with research. If you want to read on something more about that, like I said, the equine documentalist has very a lot of articles with all the research behind it and 
uh, very nice um, pictures, so you can understand what really said in those scientific articles um, in it. The ideal angle in the feet needs to be positive. So in case you do x-rays and the bone looks like that, this is not good. It should always be ideally in a straight line. The moment it's broken back, um, it's not working. Uh, I was just talking about that with Wendy before we started the webinar because she um, they developed some great x-ray blocks where the horses can actually load the feet how they want, especially when they're sore. For laminitic horses, that's great. And what you can see when you take the x-rays compared to wooden blocks, that they all align their hoof past an axis to what's the most um, comfortable for them. Usually we have the best blood flow when the hoof past an axis is aligned. And we also do have an even loading of the, ten of the tens tendons, I'm sorry. So we have different modalities. Everybody knows the sure foot pads, right? Um, then we have manual therapy. Like I said, everything you can do with your hands and this list can be longer. This is just a few of them. Acupuncture and mesotherapy. Um, acupuncture has several um, options. You can use the needles, you can use electricity. You can use it with worms. You can do it with laser. Um, you can use uh, fluid, blood, whatever um, to inject those points. Kinesio tape, I know um, Wendy did uh, a webinar with um, Sibyl Molle, who's really, really good on that. If you're interested in that, you, um, you can watch that webinar. Um, laser and infrared are great tools too for um, reducing inflammation. Same goes um, for a pulsating magnetic field. And I don't mind if it's like a beamer or if it's a magna wave or if it's a CC loops or heel fast or what's on the market. The most important is it is a pulsating magnetic field. Um, normal magnets do not help when the horse is not moving. Um, we need movement so the magnets can create a magnetic field that is moving and then we get that too. But as they're standing still, it's not helping and it's not penetrating as deep as these ones. Then there is like exercises directly to mobilize joints and do stuff. They can be passive. That means you get the limp or whatever and move it to the range of motion for the horse. This is something when you see a gifted body worker do it, do his job. Like um, for, I think Becky Tengis had also um, a webinar with Wendy where they talked about that you move the horse through all his range of motion. This is passive mobilization. Active mobilization is when you ask the horse to do a movement, for example, with a cookie or a carrot, and he does the stretches and, and all that himself. Like I said, chewing and trimming are really important for rehabilitation. We mentioned already nutrition and metabolic status. Then some exercises. Core muscle exercises are the most important exercises that you can have for any kind of rehabilitation. They always work, they always are needed, and that's something that you can always do. You can't always do the same, but you can always do something for the core muscle. Core muscles are those muscles that stabilize the whole body and the vertebra. Um, this is very important because all our nerves come out from the vertebra and innervate the rest of the muscles. So if we have problems up here because it's not stable or it's very tired, then we get bad innervation for the rest down. So we get problems with the feet, we get problems with soreness in muscles and all that. Horses can't bend properly. So your core muscles are the most important that need the most attention. So an active one that we can do is here carrot stretches. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit um, later on some more pictures and where you can information where you can find information of that. Equikinetic is something that is used extensively here in Europe. Um, Dr. Geithner um, developed that. Is it is um, impulse training. 
where you walk the horses in a bend straight, bend straight, bend straight um, way on a very tight circle um, without overloading the limbs. But it's very short, impulsive training. That means you do that 45 minutes to the left, uh, 45 seconds to 60 seconds to the left, one minute break, do the same to the right, one minute break, and in, in a walk. And in horses that are weak, you can repeat that four times and they're done. Um, this is very, very intensive, but also very rewarding. And you can do that with lame horses. It's really worth looking into that if you have a horse that you can't walk too long because it's still on restricted movement. But 15 minutes is something that you can do quickly and you can do then these exercises. Um, Wither and pelvis rocking is a very nice exercise that you can do to activate um, core muscles. You can do them that when they are on box rest. You just grab the withers and gently rock them left and right, back and forth. You can see how the horses are starting to wiggle. You can do the same if you hold their sacrum or pelvis. And if you just give a slight push from the back, and I mean slight, I, it's not push. It's really like more holding and asking them to move slightly forward. You're gonna see how their abdominal muscles contract, how their chest muscles contract and how the, the neck gets a little longer. And then you let go and let them slide back. This is all you have to do. But this is like sit-ups for us because they're contracting abdominals, releasing, contracting, releasing. If you do that for about 30 repetitions, that is quite a lot that the horse has done. And because they're moving like that, they're moving their legs in the joints a little bit, in the neck, everywhere. And that can be done when they are on box rest. Then we go down to pole work. Static pole work is something for horses that have very tight muscles, uh, especially in the chest area and the abdominals and adductors. Um, it's a it looks like, I don't know if you heard about the one pole challenge. It looks very easy, but it's difficult. You have a pole longitudinal and you march your horse over it. So it stands with the right feet, both on the right side of the pole and the left feet, both off the left side of the pole. What the horses have to do is like, they have to open here. They have to engage here. This is very difficult for them, especially when they all like that. And then you have to do this. Um, so sometimes it is a success if your horse just stands there with the two front feet over the pole. And over time, you will be able to get them forwards and stand there relaxed with the legs wide. This is something you can do also from early on when you just have five minutes walk because they do the most of it standing, but it opens up. Um, and then dynamic is just walking over poles on different heights or everything. There's lots of information you can do find about that. Podest work and balance work is something I have a little video here from one of my patients. His name's DJ. And you can see he's balancing here like a pro on a little titter tatter. You can see how it's moving and you can see how he engages all his core muscles. I let it run again. Just look at his abdominal muscles and what they do. And you see how he's working, just standing there. But that's a lot of work that he has to do. So we're at, um, yeah. Well, th this stance is similar to the stance we saw of the horse that has the uh, the the bay horse that you showed, where we're standing way yes. under. This is a temporary situation where you're just asking the horse to do that for a very short yes. period of time to engage yes. muscles, and then he should go back to a square stance. Yes, uh, this is impulse training. He does start for. 30 to 60 seconds, sometimes it's just 10 for them that is enough. When they're tired, they can walk off. But the other horse is forced to stand there 24 seven like that. Right. And, and you can see how difficult it is for him to do that. And the other horse was continuously standing there. Right. I just wanted to point that out because the, of the stance. There. Yes, yes. So this is an exercise to engage those muscles the other one is just cramped up and can't do nothing else. He can't right. even go back. This one here can go back easily. Um, 
then I don't know if you know the Equicore systems or Equiband systems where you use kind of like terabands to activate certain um, areas. Um, Narrow Stops and Hillary Clayton did a lot of research on that for rehab and core muscle strength. So there is really like some uh, scientific evidence behind that. And within six weeks, you get up to 20% more muscle and strength in your core muscles. So this is very, very effective, but you need to work it up. Never do more than 20 minutes with some of those things because your horse is going to be sore the next day if you exaggerate it, even when they can do it for an hour, but the next day you're going to have a sore horse. And also just alternate work. Every other day a horse should be worked. You shouldn't work them um, all the time intensely because the muscles tend up. Muscle have 48 hours to recover from work. Um, work means for me like really intense, and the next day you can go for a trail or you do some groundwork or something like that. And then you have, again, a day work intensely and then you have a day off and alternate the work you do. Don't always do the same work. So you get cross training is really important in horses. Otherwise, you always the same muscles will start to fatigue. Um, groundwork, like we, we've already seen, you can do lateral work, you can do circles, you can do, be creative. The more you need to be more intelligent than your horse in doing those exercises. Think ahead what you want to do, because if you repeat it three times, the horse knows already what's coming next. And they get bored and then they don't want to work. And do not do the work too hard. If the horse starts to anticipate what you're doing and gets overexcited or doesn't want to come with you, then he shows you clearly this is too much for him. He either doesn't understand the exercise or he can't do it. Short foot pads are always an option too for um, core muscle exercises. And that's something you can also do from day one on when they are still on box rest. Very nice for that. Um, somebody's asking what podest work is, and I think you mean po pedestal. Yeah, pedal stool. It's the same like this, just not rocking. This is advanced. And, you know, like just for, especially horses with high lows, that means very uneven hoofs or something like that, if they have to stand up in front, that's something that you can even integrate in your feeding schedule, you know? Um, you just make a potters where just the front legs are on and have the hay a little higher up for one feeding. So he always needs to stand up there and then he can't go into this compensation stance because this is what I mean with those generated movement patterns. They're so used to stand like that. So they're loading always one foot here and this part and this one here. So the feet grow like that. Um, if you can interrupt that by just changing that for one feeding a day, where you have the, the hay at chest height and it needs to go up a pedal, pedestal, pedestal you call that, right? Yep. Then you change that habit already and you teach the body a new pattern. And that's really easy. And that is part of rehabilitation. It doesn't have to be always an exercise you're actively doing, but this is also a very important part. And it's a lot of exercise. And Sharon May Davis looked a lot into it um, for her rehabilitation for the um, equine uh, congenital cervical malformations, because those horses often do those compensation stands, and it helps them to build up more muscles when they are challenged a little bit. And when you change feeding position, sometimes a little um, on chest height and then on the ground again, if you change that, they're also doing changes. She said it's like in nature when they are eating from a bush or when they're um, going and, and find some leaves or something like that, that it's, it's also mimicking nature. And it's cross-training. Then we have those passive and active range of motions. Active range of motions like cookie stretches. And so you can do yourself because the worst thing that happens is 
you don't do it correctly and the horse cheats, but you don't do any damage. If you do passive range of motion, I would um, recommend you learn it from somebody who knows actually how to do it and shows it tailored to your horse what will be the perfect exercise and how it's done and what you really need to focus on. Um, then another thing we can do is proprioceptive stimulus. Proprioception is for the body to learn where in space it is. So um, is my arm up now or is it behind my back? I can't see it, but I know exactly where it is because the muscle tension and the tension in my ligaments and everywhere tells me where it is. Um, for horses, this is very important. And this is where barefoot horses have a little bit advantage over horses shot in steel shoes. Um, when they are in flexible, um, um, how is it called, polyurethane or something like that, shoes, then you can have also a little bit of movement in there. So, so you get a little bit more of stimulus. But what you can do even when they have metal shoes is you can change surfaces. You can change from hard ground to soft sand over um, roots and stuff like that. And this is also very, very important for development for folds because the more um, different the surfaces are, it needs, it's, it's important for them to have rocky terrain. It's important that it goes up and down because the development of the body and the healing of the body is way better like that. And it's again a cross training because you do not always use the same muscles the same way. Like I said, wobble bars or surefoot pads do the same because the horses is always working a little bit. You see that especially when you put them on the first time and they really start to sway and do like that. So this is a lot of proprioceptive input that is getting into their body. And oftentimes you see, no, you see um, how they um, re are really relaxed afterwards because it helps them also to release tension in some of the tissues. Another exercise that you can do without any problems at home is a tactile stimulus. This is, it has a bad rep if you think about the big leg horses with their chains. Um, you can do something a little bit similar with a really tiny little one. You can also use a kicking ring or just a bell boot. The important thing is when we have, let's say we have a weak right hind that needs more training because we know we have a little less muscle there and it's a young horse and that's his weak leg. So you can put a bell boot on the right hind and have a big bell boot. So it needs to be wobbling around. So what happens with every step is it comes down onto the coronet and when it touches the carny band, the reaction from the horse is to go against it. So it lifts the leg a little faster and a little higher. And here we're talking about a few milliseconds and a few centimeters where they lift it higher, but it's measurable. But if you do that for 20 minutes for every step you do, that is quite an extensive exercise for those horses. That's why I said, do not do it more than 20 minutes when you said that, or it will be sore the next day. Then we can do something to train our pectoral muscles because a lot of horses I see they're hanging in their thoracic sling. They're like have the shoulder blades up like that. They're weak like that. You have like here, the um, serratus and all those muscles are weak or contracted. And what they, those horses have to learn, they need to learn to do that again. Really like get their withers up and not hang in there. Um, you can use some of the um, bands like um, Terra bands or so to help them here to get them up again. You can use a tactile stimulus again, have one of, like in Arabian horses, we have some nice um, chest collars with all those dangling things there. What it does, it touches the whole time the chest is every time they go a little bit against it when it touches and they open up. You can even make some with your kids. I have clients who did very nice things like with little um, buttons 
where they had like the kids do that and then make little notes and, and and it was really really cute but it helped the horses and the kids loved it because they made it themselves again short foot pads help with um with relaxation and also because it's like the wither wiggles we work here on the chest musculature so you're training the thoracic sling muscles again and then again static and dynamic pole work, hill work, especially up and down, uh, especially down work is very, very strong on your thoracic sling because when you go down, you have more weight here. So they need to work more here. So then these are the uh, veterinary issues I'm gonna have a look at with you today for rehabilitation. First, the tendons, we're gonna go, uh, the core muscle strength, we look again first. Uh, sorry, I forgot that because I said how important that is. Here are a few examples. Um, young horses and rehab horses, this needs to be your main focus on. Do, like I said, just train in short repetitions. Impulse training is what it's needed. Here you see a little halflinger at the beginning of the exercises. Um, what you often see in young horses, they when you launch them, they race through the circle or also in the round pen, um, like they're a bike leaning into um, the circle. This is very detrimental for their ligaments and tendons, because if you look here, you can see the forces from the horse. Here's the shoulder. It goes down like that. So there's a lot of strain here. And that's why we see a lot in young horses when they don't carry themselves properly and lean into circles um, or bends that you get popped splints. This is because they're not engaging their core muscles properly. This is the same horse six weeks later. What you see here is that he learned to turn his chest because if you go into a bend and want to get the force down straight, you need to rotate your chest, you need to activate your core muscles. And like that, the forces, this is the same length, but you see the horse is leaning way less and the leg is way more under the center than it is here. Same speed, same horse, different strength of core muscles. Then when we talk about core muscles, this is the deep ventral line. Again, that's one of the nice anatomic models that the equine documentalist has on his webpage um, where you can click on every muscle. Here we did the deep ventral line that are um, covering um, the, um, can I say, it? like the ventral part of your stabilizing core muscles. In addition, there is in the latissimus, that's the one who is responsible for the main rotation. And it's missing the top line that everybody knows. That's why I didn't put it, where is my, here. That's why it's not in here. This is your ligamentum nuca, and then you have the longissimus dorsi, iliocostalis, like all the muscles here up top, the long back muscles uh, that most of the people know. These are also part of your core muscles. But don't forget what is really important, your diaphragm is part of your core muscles. The diaphragm is not just here to breathe. A lot of people think that's the only, um, how do I say, function the diaphragm has, but it's just part of the function. The diaphragm is like a big flap but it has two distinguished columns and they're the size of my arm in there, lying on the left side here and on the right side coming down like that. And those pillars are the ones who get the major stabilizing action to the inside of the thoracic chest. It has a fascial connection here, up here to the iliopsoas who is our major flexure of the hip. And this is why it's so important. If you have a contraction here 
or the horse is not flexible through his pelvis, you will always get a shallow breathing because they can't stretch through here if there is too much tension here. Same goes for the rib muscles. If we have, due to coughing or a saddle that's not fitting properly or so, here contracted muscles that stabilize up the ribs up here, the horses can't breathe properly. And you have to help them to learn again to use their diaphragm. Um, then what the core muscles are responsible for, except for getting the limbs forward, that's more or less everything that they do otherwise. Posture and stance, like um, when they stand still or when they sleep or rest is done by core muscles. The leg muscles can sleep a little bit due to the reciprocal apparatus where they just hang up something or it's very, that's why we have so many tendinous structures in the leg. Tendons don't use hardly any energy because they have hardly any blood flow. And um, so they're very good for resting long time. But the action actually comes from up top and the stability. They can't rest if the stability up top is not working properly. Everything that we saw that has to do with bending or like you think about a vaulting horse who has people up on top doing that all the time and jumping up and down. He needs to balance out the rider and also those people doing all those exercises on top. And that's why you have usually very big vaulting horses. They need a certain mass to be able to work against the lever and the forces that you have from three people stacked on top of them. Like even if a little movement up there is quite a big force down there because you have the lever working on the horse. That's why core muscle strength is very important and where these horses exceed extremely. Then also um, the transmission of pr propulsion from the hind to the front, like when you see when you do those wiggle exercises I told you from back to front, this is the core muscles that do that. So what the force that the hind legs generate gets transmitted to the front over the core muscles. That's what you wanna see when you say you wanna have a heel up gallop when they sit under and they do that. It's the same when you do a sliding stop. It's the core muscles that, that help the horse to be able to do it. It's not the legs, it's not just the hind leg. It's the abdominals that help to splint so they actually can sit down and do that. Balance, like I said, with a, the example with the vaulting horse or the rider, um, they need to balance out what we're doing. And it's the same for us if you're unstable, uh, but you uh, contract your abdominal muscles, you're more stable. If you're on a wobbling board, you know, if you're too long or on there, it's going to be your abdominals that are sore and not your legs. That's because balance comes out of your deep core muscles. And side movement too is also generated from your core muscles. Because again, when you go sideways, you need to rotate your chest to be able to get the leg over and here. If you don't do that, you can't get the leg over. These are horses that have problems with transition to the side that do not activate the core muscles properly. So here is Narrell doing all those nice exercises with the carrot, so carrot or cookie stretches. You can see on this one, how you activate the top and loin abdominal. Here is important, the horse stands straight. Here it cheats a little bit, as you can see. This leg is okay, here it cheats. So that's not a proper stretch, but that's something you can work on. When you have a horse doing that on, all, on this side all the time, swap the side and go from this side. And then he's putting more weight on this one because he's slightly bent towards you. And he might then crack this one, but this one is straight. So you can do it just on both sides. Here, this is to the side to engage movement. Um, important is the ears here need to be on the same level as they're here. You don't wanna have them come back like that because then they just rotate around their um, C1, C2 and get it instead of doing a flexion 
correctly, um, they just do that. That's when you have a stiff neck and you turn around. You can't do that. What you do is like you do it like that. So that's the same that they're doing. They're just cheating. Um, this is the same. Oh, where is it? That's the same, just from a different perspective and a little lower. The lower you go, the more muscles you engage. And you can see it's not just the neck that works and the abdominals. Here you can see how they have to engage the hind limb and all the lateral muscles here and up top to do that. Here it's even to a more extreme. You can see this leg and the hind limb on the lateral side need to work extremely more while they engage their core muscles. These pictures are from a booklet called Activate Your Horse's Core from Hillary Clayton and Dr. Uh, Dr. Hillary Clayton and Narrow Stubbs. And you find a lot of more exercises with um, very detailed explanation how to do it. Here we have again, a list of what helps like hill work up and down. You can also back up a hill. If you back up a hill or if you stop while going down and then start again, or if you walk up or if you walk down and back up a few steps and go down while you're on a trail, just do that three, four times. That's already activating the core muscles because if they have to stop when working upwards, and start again, they need to push from behind, they need to use their abdominals. So that's already a very good exercise. If you go down and you stop and back them up a little bit, they also need to tuck their belly under, uh, their hinds under, activate their chest and their abdominals, and then walk forward again. Some very easy things you can do while you're on a trail. Same as lateral work, you don't need to be in arena. You can do that if you have like, a road and it has like two lines, just go from one side to the other. It can even be on a forest path. It's important, just it's important that the horses bend correctly and goes a little bit sideways. In the beginning, it's perhaps just a little bit the shoulder in. You don't have to have that crossing, but it's just, and then over time, you'll see the horses get more and more flexible because their chest muscles, their thoracic slim, and their core muscles are getting more strong. Again, sure foot pads, you can start that for core muscle strength while they're still on box rest, or when you have a day off, you can do that. Rehabilitation always starts at a walk. You build up the most muscles in a walk because the core muscles are the most activated at the walk and at the counter not at the trot. Trot is an energy saving um, movement pattern. Um, that's when you see when they're jogging through, they don't need a lot of energy. They just go forward like that and they can block their muscle up top and they just do a little bit like that. Uh, it uses way less energy than a canter or a walk where they have to use their core much more. So any questions to the general overview. Uh, I haven't seen any. I think you're doing a really thorough job and it's not generating any questions. <laughs> Good. So we come now to the more specific part. First, I want to go with you a little bit through tendon in generals. So um, tendons are fibrous collagen tissue and the tendon is always connecting a muscle to the bone. This is the definition of a tendon. A ligament is connecting bone to bone. That's just the definition. The tissue itself is more or less the same. It's just what they're doing. Their job is a little bit different and um, what they're connecting. Uh, because tendons do always transmit forces from muscle to bone. And because they usually make a joint move afterwards, this is what you get when a, when a muscle contracts, you have a joint movement somewhere. We have two types of tendons um, and two functions of tendons. One is that concerns that conserve energy and can release it again. These have more elastic fibers. And then we have some that 
withstand more loading forces. They are more rigid. Um, all tendons do have both, but some of them do have more elastic fibers and some of them do have more rigid fibers because some of them are required to um, conserve energy and release it again. So like a kangaroo, when they jump, most of their energy is stored in their tendons and then released again. They do not lose a lot of force once they're on. That's why you see them, their jumps get all bigger and bigger till they are at the max and then stay there. The same as for um, horses. And some are, are, are needed to just keep everything in place. Tendons do not like to be stretched. That might sound funny, but most of the stretch from a tendon comes out of their muscle belly up top and not from the tendon itself. For example, the extensor tendon in the front usually stretches an average of 2.5%. That's hardly anything. It ruptures when you stretch it by 10%. That's a big margin when it doesn't have, when it just has to do 2.5%. That's 400% margin till it ruptures. But it's still very little. If we think of a front limb of a leg of a horse, a meter we have easily. So if we stretch it by 10 centimeters, this is the margin where it's gonna rupture if the tendon has to stretch like that. So, but still, it's 400 times that what it usually needs to stretch. Um, then, like I said, we have functional difference between positional tendons and energy storing tendons. We're gonna go more into that. Like I um, mentioned already, uh, our common digital, digital extensor tendon at the front of the leg, it's a typical positional tendon. All that that tendon does is keep the leg stretched. It doesn't have to do anything else. While the superficial flexor tendon that we have at the back, it's the main one that goes down, stores the energy and releases again when the spring goes off. Um, ligaments are here to stabilize joints and to guide movement in a specific um, range of motion. Uh, joints help, they also help the joints with proprioception. Our ligaments are full of mechanoreceptor. That means they have a lot of nerve endings in there that tell the body there is tension, there is pressure, it hurts. Um, so they're very important. And like I said, they're important to keep the joint stabilized. A joint capsule in our, alone is not enough to stabilize a joint, especially lower down on the legs where we do not have muscles. We need ligaments to help with stabilization. Then we have different types of collagen. Like we've seen ligaments and tendons are made out of collagen. There is five different types of collagen. The most important ones that we see are the first four ones. Type one collagen is the major one of the tendons. That is the one that is the most elastic. That's why we find it everywhere also in the, in the, um, can I say? Also in fascia, it is also the first one that gets built up on bone. Um, because bone is always first built up um, from collagen. And then we have the little osteoblasts come in and fill it afterwards up with calcium. But they also first build it up as a collagen structure. And then it gets filled with calcium and um, gets into bone. Um, then that's why collagen is so important for bone healing. It's not just for cartilage, tendon, and ligaments. Type two is the one we find the most in cartilage and also bones. Type three is old type ones, um, to be said. When they major, they change from type one into type two. If they get a little old and tired, they're, they're changing into a type three. 
Then we have type four. This is what we find in scar tissue. These are usually pelamella, really hard to move, um, very rigid collagen fibers that are very tightly bound. These ones up here, they're very loosely bound. That's why they're so elastic. And type five is something that you find on the surface of hair. Everything that can keratinize uh, has the possibility to keratinize has some type five collagen in them. Then blood supply and innovation. If we look here, we have the picture of a little muscle cell together with its tendon. We're gonna look a little more closely at the tendon further on. Well, what you can see is here, the little fascia um, sacs. And in between here, we have the blood vessels. So like the tendons, also the muscles do not have the blood vessels directly in their um, fibers, but they're around them. The same goes for tendons. And as you can see, different to the muscles, but even more pronounced in the tendons, we will have just in the outer part, in the paramecium, we're going to have blood vessels in a tendon. A tendon is very, very poorly vascularized. So uh, that's also why they take so long to heal. So as a rule of thumb, like bone has four letters. So, uh, no, <sighs> yeah, bone has four letters. So it takes usually four months, three to four months till they're fully healed. Then um, muscle has like a M U S C E. Oh, <laughs> we have six letters. So we have six to seven to eight weeks for muscle injuries to heal. Tendons have eight letters, so we have eight months average to heal. And ligaments have way longer, so they have nine to 12 months to heal. The longer the word, the longer they take to heal. Um, like we see here, we have poor blood supply. The ligaments, they also just have uh, microvascularization, um, that means tiny, tiny little blood vessels at their insertion sites. That means where they attach to both bones. Innovation is different. We have lots of different um, muscles. Then the function, like I said, we have a lot of free nerve endings here. That they measure pressure with different um, um, receptors here. Tension that is a very, very important one. It's the so-called Golgi tendon organ. Oh, that's wrong. It, it should be GTO. Um, the GTO is here. If a tension, thus, if a tendon gets too much tension, there is a negative reflex or back cycle to the muscle. The muscle usually has muscle spindle cells that contract. If, they're, if they contract too fast and too hard, the probability that the tension is gonna rupture is very high. So we have a safety um, measurement in here, and this is our Golgi tendon organ. If these contract too fast and these receptors feel too much tension, they can, without that it even goes up to the brain, can tell directly the muscle to relax. So the tension is off the tendon. And this is something that's, for example, used when you see somebody work with chiropractic, where you have those little movements, or you perhaps have seen those people work with hammers or those vibrating machines. That's exactly what's happening. This is a fast twitch movement that is too fast for the muscles from contracting, and the tendons can't follow. So you get a negative feedback to the muscle and it relaxes. Um, can, can we just clarify a little bit on the months versus weeks with the time it takes to heal? I think bone, four letters, you talked in weeks. And no, yeah, four months maximum. No, it's a month, sorry. 
Okay, so four months for bone. Yeah, eight to 12 weeks usually. Okay. Or so up that's to 16 actually weeks. Two yeah. months for bone. And then how many months for muscle? For the muscle, it's just six to eight weeks. So it is weeks. So yeah, it's actually it shorter weeks. than bone. Yes, much shorter. We have a much bigger blood supply. We have the biggest blood supplies in muscles. We have a little less in bone and we have very little in tendon and ligaments. Okay, so the longest really time to heal is your ligaments, then your tendons, then your bones, and then your muscles. Yeah, but if you have a fully ruptured muscles, like an important one, like a biceps femoris or something like that, it can still take up to half a year till the horse is again fully there, but that has more to do with adhesions that you have and then the recovery of the muscle that needs to build up, but healed itself. So it's no longer sore. It's very quickly. Relative. So, and of course, you know, the bigger the damage, the longer it takes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wrong side. Here we go. Okay, this is something that is really important to know, especially if you have folds. Um, when they're born, they have um, cell matrix to cells. Here, if you look at that picture, this is matrix. And these little dots, these are the cells that produce the matrix. Um, we have one to one um, ratio. That means we have a lot of cells. And cells are the things that can, um, how do I say it? that can divide itself and grow. So one cell can divide itself and then we have two cells and three cells. So we get a bigger mass. So this is actual growth by multiplying itself. And only, oops, tendoblasts, these are the cells, the young cells can multiply. So in young tendons, we actually can multiply. Then in older tendons, we get tenocytes. These are old cells. They do no longer multiply, but they can still grow by matrix. Here at the top with number A, you're gonna see tenocytes in the middle of the tendon. You can see they're very slim and they seem to have a very loose connection. That means we have the biggest elasticity there. If we go, towards the outer core of the tendon. Where is my, here. The outer core of the tendon, you see we get more roundish cells and the um, connection of the matrix is more dense. So we have a little less elasticity. If we come down to number C, where you can even see that there is more bluish areas and they look a little bit like little cigarettes, this is where we have even more dense tissue and in connection where they attach to bones or muscles or whatever. These are attachment tenocytes. So you can see even the tenocytes have different types. What is now important to know, tenoblast tush just exists up to two years of age. That means our tendon major till they're two years of age. And after that is done. If you do not have more tendon um, cells, there will no more tendon cells be growing. This is done at 24 months of age. Very important. So tendons do like to grow with impulse training. Full throw is that perfectly. You have a crazy 10 minutes where they run around like they've been stung by a bee and then they sleep for two hours. So we have the perfect recovery. You have tension, 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 recovery, impulse training again. And it's also important for tendons to major to have a lot of proprioceptive input. Like I said, um, ligaments like in the hoof, your um, lamina are also ligaments. And the more input you get, the more those tenoblasts um, are challenged, the faster they divide and the more of them we have. So in the first two months, it's really important for foals 
to move, to have uneven surface, not just a soft sand that's even or grass. Go with them out in the field, take them with mommy for a trail ride. So they go through the forest where there's hard ground, there's rocks, there's stuff they have to climb over, they have to go to, through rivers with rocky underground and stuff like that. All those proprioceptive input and tendon challenge will help them to grow better tendons. So, because so, if, so if I got this right, let me just make sure I have this right. It's in the first two years of life that they can make more tendon cells. Yes. But once the, after two years, all they're gonna do is make ten, the tendon cells they have larger. Yeah, they grow. Okay, it and so the more larger. we can stimulate, give them stimulation to make more tendon cells during those first two years of life, the better off they're gonna be. Yes. Okay, got yes. it. That's really important. And we often forget them. The tendons grow in size, like I say here, when we talk about the matrix down here, they increase with growth. So this pink area gets bigger. Um, the fibers increase in diameter, but their numbers doesn't increase anymore. Right. Major tendons do not get more um, tenoblasts. When we're lucky and we have an injury, we can have some stem cells going there and repairing and developing into tenoblasts. But this is cells from outside that have to come in and take over healing. Um, then the water content um, and poly, um, mucopolysaccharide content decreases with age. And like I said, the collagen type changes from one to three. So they get a little bit more rigid. We know that ourselves, we were way more flexible when we were kids. And if I see kids, how they can fall down and do how gummy movements they are, if you can see how they sleep like that or anything uh, for us that makes, is, is more difficult because we have a different collagen taking over in our tendons and ligaments. Um, the glucosaminoglycan content sinks and type co three collagen in increases the same again. What is important to know, micro damage occurs continuously to the matrix and gets repaired with every step and every training, especially in the core of the tendon where we have the number A fiber types, because these are the most elastic ones. These have the most stress, and these are the ones that break down first. That's when you usually have a tendon injury and you do an ultrasound, it's in the center of the tendon. Did you say what GAG is? Did I miss it? Gluc glucosaminoglycan, glycosaminoglycan, sorry. That's okay. It's so it. long, I'm cheating. That's all right. We, well, I do have a question for you about this point. Um, somebody said her Mustang gelding got an inadequate nutrition and lack of food as a foal through the first year of his life. His wild herd was rounded up due to starvation when he was a year old. In the picture she has, he wasn't emaciated, but not at healthy weight for a yearling. He has since had chronic injury and re-injury to his tendons and ligaments in the distal limb. Could this be part of his nutritional issues as a foal? Yes. No. Yes, because if you start at minus 50 at what that fall did and had an injury back then, it's really hard to get onto zero and where others are at plus 100. So he is already at, um, at a disadvantage from one year old of age. And also what is part of that is when they have malnutrition, their bones are also not properly stable. Like I said, when we saw they're not moving properly or do not get proper nutrition, you have some osteoporosis there. So the attachment of the tendons is also not properly or of the ligaments. And what you see, they often develop early arthritis where you have the cartilage attached like the capsule of the joint. And if you have uh, instability because there's not so much um, muscle there to stabilize that whole thing, 
and then you have a bone that's not very stable, then you get early arthritic signs in the capsule, like where the attachment of the capsule is not inside the joint itself. But these are typical signs that you see with malnutrition. That's why I said nutrition is very, very important um, for growing animals. Also, the embryo, um, that might be like off topic now, but for example, if you have an embryo and in the last trimester of the pregnancy, um, if you feed, there's like studies done on that, if you feed proper minerals to the mare while she's pregnant, you're going to have up to 40% less OCD than uh, in a fall that where the mayor didn't have proper nutrition. They actually did a study in Ireland on racehorses of that, where they covered the same mares with the same stallion in two consecutive years. The first year they didn't get any, any supplements and the second year they did. And this was the findings they found. And that is a lot. So yeah, nutrition is important, especially in young growing animals and also in embryos. Don't forget that. Um, Cross-sectional growth, like we said, that here just increases over time with the age of the horse. And what's different, what's also important to know, we have significant differences between breeds. Like for example, thoroughbreds that are bred for speed and speed needs a lot of energy storing tendons because you get faster when you don't need the muscle, but you get it out of your tendon. Um, they have up to 20% more elastic fibers in their tendons, but they also have more laxity. That's also what you see when they're racing. If you look at thoroughbred in slow motion, you often see their fat love drop to the ground because they have so much elastic fibers in there. Um, if you compare that with a Frisian, that is FH, Frisian horse, who still has a lot of um, Arabic and um, Spanish, um, how do I say, like ancestors, you're going to find they have also quite elastic tendons. If you compare it to a warm blood who has, we have to be honest, um, cold blood in them, like they were really drafty mares that they crossed with thoroughbreds. That's how we got warm blood. They have more um, energy or static fibers than energy storing fibers. And that's why we see differences in injuries um, with these type um, of horses in work. Uh, then um, just something normal about their longitudinal growth. They grow throughout the length, like they grow in diameter here. They also grow in length like that. Uh, what's different to bones where we have growth plates? Like here. We see here is a bone. This is a very nice graph from Dr. Simon Curtis. Uh, he allowed me to use that because I like that so much. Here you can see in a foal the growth plates we have or in a young horse. This is where the tendon grows in length. The diameter gets bigger over age, but the length only happens here. And as we can see, the cuffing bone and the navicular bone are already fully grown. All they do is get bigger in diameter. They do not have any length. Their growth plates are already finished when they get born. This is important for our deep digital flexor tendon who attaches down here at the bone because it is not very good if you have something that has the major weight of the whole body on there um, with the pull on a bone that would not be finished growing. Um, if we look at the tendons quickly, we have our two positional tendons or three positional tendons. We have the common extensor digital tendon and the lateral um, extensor tendon. These 
like I said, they just need to prevent the forward buckling. So there is not so much end stretching of the leg. There's not so much movement. At the back of the leg, our positional tendon is, oops, where is it? Here. The deep digital flexor tendon that we have up here with its check ligament. And then we have our two energy storing or elastic tendons. The most important is here, our superficial tendon that attaches here at P2 and P1. Um, this is, oh, how are the names of them? In English, um, how is the button? Sorry. Still I have to, uh... Pastern, pastern bow, that's your pa the short pastern and your long pastern here. Sorry. And um, when you can see, this is the other one. This is your suspensory ligament. The suspensory ligament is very special because that is the only tendon or ligament that can actually grow, that we can see that can get stronger throughout the life because it is an actual muscle. It's called interosseous. And the part up here has still muscle fibers inside the tendon. So it is something in between. It doesn't have the high elasticity. It has half the elasticity of a superficial digital tendon, but it still has more than the... Um, than the deep digital flexor tendon. The check ligaments are just our little combinations that are connections between the tendon itself and some bony prominence, so they don't slip up. Like, like, said, like it said earlier, they do have some stability. Um, they provide some stability for, each, for tissues. It doesn't have to be just collateral ligaments that we have here, but also check ligaments are here for stability. Um, yeah, what perhaps is interesting to know, um, if you look at the growth plates here, up till here, they're about closed from three months. And here we talk about five to seven months, depending how fast they grow. Um, if we're here in the carpus, that is up to one and a half years. Um, we have often horses developing club feet from three to six months. That's the, that's the time window where foals develop club feet. This is due, where is my angle? This is due to this growth plate and those tendons. If we have too much energy in our food, these bones or that bone here grows very, very fast in that time. And bones can grow incredibly fast. And by that, I mean one or two millimeters a day. This is huge. Sometimes we really think we'll look at our animals and think, yeah, this has grown overnight. And it literally has. Unfortunately, those tendons cannot grow that fast. So what happened is we get a contraction of the superficial flexor tendon because it can't grow as fast as this one. And the fetlock drop, when this one goes up, is exaggerated. So what happens is when this one contracts, our pedal bone goes down. And this is why they say we're gonna cut the check ligament to get them sinking again and to prevent the club foot. This can be prevented with proper nutrition. And if you catch them early on, you can give them some muscle relaxants and anti-inflammatory and help the tendons. I know there is a supplement in the States that you have, it's called Legate that you can use, but you need to reduce the energy. It's a nutritional problem that causes those club feet in combination with some genetics, but it, the really push over the edge is the nutrition. Just a little side remark. 
<laughs> um, here we have the tendon structure like we had it before from the muscle. Here you see like helical structure, tiny fibers, more tiny fibers to a bundle, a lot of little bundles to a tiny fiber and more. And here we're finally in the millimeter. And here you see we have the first blood vessels. Just here we do have blood vessels. And these are the things that rupture. These are those micro tears we have been talking about. So you see, they're very, very far away from the first blood vessels that we have in, in those tendons. That's why it takes so long to heal. So then, finally, injuries. <laughs> The acute, we can have two different types of tendon injuries. An acute with a sudden onset, that's usually due to a kick or something like that, or due to a hit um, or a cut or something like that, trauma related. This is called an acute tendon injury. Chronic tendon injuries occur also um, acute. I mean, the horse is actually lame, but it is, either due to fatigue, overuse, or what I said, that repetitive microtrauma, or metabolic issues that the little micro tears don't heal properly. And then those normal tears kind of add up, and then we have a core lesion. Um, the, we do have intrinsic factors. Like I said, metabolism is one. Confirmation. Um, that means also if we have long toes, low heels, Renata Veller did a study on that, like one centimeter of toe length extra equals 4% more, uh, no, equals 50 kilograms more, what's that, 100 pounds, more pull on the deep digital flexor tendon, or one degree lower in palmar or plantar angles, equals 4% more pull on the tendon. And we have seen earlier that a tendon ruptures, depending on which tendon it is, between 10 and 20%. The average for the superficial flexor tendon is 16.6% .6 pull and it starts to rupture. So if we gallop and we have a long shoeing cycle where they drop down two to 3%, we have an extra 12% pull on that tendon if we wait too long with our shoeing. And this is causing micro tears in that tendon. And then due to that, we have a repetitive trauma. And then there's one day where you have been on the normal counter, no stumbling, nothing but pang, tendon injury. Um, the other thing is like muscle strings. If muscle get weak or overworked or contracted, they can't stretch properly and contract how they should. So there is more pull on the tendons or more injuries and scar tissues. These are all intrinsic factors. Extrinsic factors is stuff that comes in from the outside. Foot balance goes in there. Um, training intensity. Do we overwork the horses? Do the muscles get then tired? Work surface, the softer the ground and the more spring it is, the more tendon injuries you're going to have because it fatigues the muscle faster. This is why they had to change. For example, what's the big cross country you have? X, X, um, cross country competition you have in the States. Oh, the one in Kentucky. Yeah. Land Rover. No, the other one. There's another one. Um, it's called Rolex. Yeah, Rolex. Get, yeah. Yes, they now have to change the surface there because it was too springy and caused too many tendon injuries. That's also something we see in dressage horses when they work them in those super modern springy things. We have a way higher incidence of high suspensory injuries on the hind limbs due to that. You need to reduce your time working in a springy surface compared to a hard surface because it's way more work on the ligaments. Then rider fitness. 
and right balance is also a big part because we know now the horse needs to balance that with the core muscles if the core muscles fatigue the, the forces don't go properly straight down on the legs and this can cause an overuse of the tendons in certain areas tack same goes for a saddle if we have a saddle that pinches a horse somewhere and it stops to move its chest and core muscles properly because it's splinting, you are overloading the limbs. This is also something that you see in those horses ridden with roll core, because what happens if they come back and low, low, you call it low, low and what, low and deep or something like that, low and round is another word for it. If you ride horses like that, you block the back movement. And what you get is tension steps. The horses are throwing the legs forward without moving the core muscles. And this is causing excessive forces on their joints and ligaments and tendons. So how you ride, where you ride, what tack you use has a major influence and is called an extrinsic factor for tendon injuries. Just about nomenclature, strain against sprain. It's absolutely the same. It's just a chronic soft tissue injury or rupture of them. Um, just according to Wikipedia, sprain is in ligaments and strain is in tendon. So a sprain is a strain in a ligament. Wait, you have but strain you can use... in ligaments and sprain is in tendon? It's... Yes, a strain, a strain is in tendons. And a sprain is a strain in a ligament. Okay, okay, okay. It's just, it's nomenclature. It just right. means it's it has an injury. It's a soft injury, a soft tissue injury in a tendon or a ligament due to overstretching. Then we have an avulsion injury. This means it's where the insertion of the tendon or the ligament is and it gets gets pulled out of the bone. So the connection between bone and ligament ruptures. It's not inside the tendon, it's where it attaches to the bone. And then we have a laceration, that's again back our acute injury, where we have a partial or complete cut. That can be due to blunt trauma, that can be due to a wire cut, um, whatever, but this is called a laceration. Now, we have three healing phases in a tendon injury. The first one is the inflammatory phase. This is um, in the first five to 10 days, usually the first week. And this is when, when I said, when we have those acute um, inflammation cells coming in, eating away all the dead tissue and causing an active inflammation. It's swollen, it's hot. That's where you really have to cool it. Then from the second week on, we go into the reparative phase. This means when the collagen, collagen synthesis synthesis starts again, the fibers start to grow again. We have um, scar tissue forming. This is from the second week on, and it takes up till about eight weeks post-injury. So we have one week where it's really don't do anything, let it stand still. And from the second week on, we should start moving horses with a tendon injury. Um, this is also the phase where you would do um, stem cell injections or IRAP or PRP to call in um, uh, they have a homing effect on stem cells, so they recruit them, so we have a better healing and a faster healing. There is also some artificial stuff that you can use, like Tendo Plus or something. That needs is something you have to talk about with your vet, because this is something uh, that depends on how much money do you want to stand, spend, how fast does it have to heal, and then, then. And then the last one is the remodeling phase. This starts from the eight or nine weeks on. And this means you have to increase the load 
of your work to help the collagen fibers grow in an orientated direction. Otherwise, we get scar tissue that grows in all directions. Here is the, the second phase is where the tent, where the where everything comes together and starts to build up again. And then in the remodeling phase, we're gonna make it again so it is it holds up to load. This is the last one, and this can be up to one year till we have full strength, depending on how big the injury was. That means this is when you can gallop again. So you see, it takes some time for proper healing of tendons. Here is, um, again, a little overview and what is important when you have an injury. First, you need to know exactly where the injury is if you want to do an optimal tendon rehabilitation. This is why I explained to you before, this tendon does have a different um, property to that one. One gets loaded when the other one gets unloaded. So for example, the suspensory and the superficial whoops, tendon, sorry, uh, they get loaded um, when the deep flexor tendon gets unloaded and vice versa. So if we have an injury in the superficial tendon, we should lower the heels to load the deep flexor tendon more. Um, if we have an injury to the deep flexor tendon, we should lift the heels to unload the deep flexor tendon more and load more the superficial. Um, the suspensory, because it's like a mix of everything, it depends where the injury is. If we have an injury up here, where it acts, especially in the hinds, more like the deep flexor tendon, then lifting or stabilizing it is more important. If it is an injury down here, where it acts definitely like the superficial flexor tendon, we should lower the, the heel more. If it's on a lateral branch, we can give some support laterally so it doesn't sink in that much. So there is a lot we can do, and it depends also on the surface you work your horse, um, what kind of trimming or shoeing protocol you're gonna have. But your farrier or trimmer can't do anything when they don't know where the injury is. Um, then, Tendons, I, that, I want to stress that because I see so many people that have horses with tendon injury that keep them wrapped. Please don't do that. Um, tendons are very heat sensitive. When a horse walks or trots for 30 minutes, we get very, very high temperatures inside the tendons due to the storage of the forces and releasing and, and that. We get 34 to 35 Celsius. That means 123 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit in a healthy tendon. If you wrap that in addition for work uh, or when they are on rest, this means you're gonna overheat the tendon. You literally cook the collagen. Collagen does not like being cooked. It disintegrates. So it's not good to wrap them. What you can use is some of the stable boots that are very loosely that use some infrared for rehabilitation because they do not have a tight connection or it. So there's some way of um, heat, um, transmission possible so they they can stay they stay warm but they don't overheat um, another thing like in cross country or show jumping where you have to wear protection this is usually a little piece of kevlar and then they have, have a mesh on the side for the good ones so you still have some earth air circulation while you have during and have protection but everything that wraps it very tightly like for investment where you have neoprene that's even if you have been in the sun with a suit on for diving you know how hot you get very quickly and the same happens to the tendon these things can even 
predispose horses for tendon injuries because like a wrap with the neoprene protection will not stop the fetlock from dropping down and overusing a tendon. Contrary, it will predispose them because the tendons get weaker. Um, just a short reminder, if a horse walks, it has 50% of its body weight on each limb. So we're talking about 500 pounds in a normal thousand pound horse, right? Uh, what, what? Yeah. let me do the math. Um, how much is a, is a horse? Uh, you know, thousand pounds, yeah. yeah. So we're talking about 500, yeah, um, off on each limb. If you have, if you trot, this increases by threefold due to the force. Speed by mass is force. So you're going to have one and a half times body weight on one leg. So this is 1,500 pounds. This is why it's so important to have long enough walk for rehabilitation before you go on to trot. It's not the time, it's the forces that increase by three times. If you go then to canter, where we have a one leg stand, you increase the forces by two and a half times the body weight. So you double again, more or less, from, from trot to canter, or you increase it fivefold from walk to canter. This is very important that you keep that in mind. How much the forces change when you change the gait. Um, for nutrition for tendon injuries, um, hydrolyzed collagen type 1 and 2 are very, very good because they help healing. Core muscle exercises, proprioceptive input where the um, sure foot pads are really, really good and light movement, control movement. Then more concrete, like make sure the shoeing protocol is correct for the problem you have. Um, muscle imbalances should be um, addressed. If you have one muscle that's weaker than the other, you need to tonify the weaker one and the one that's really contracted, you need to relax that. So um, if you have a very nice body worker around there uh, who can show you to do that or helps you to do that, this is absolutely excellent for something like that. Cookie stretches or carrot stretches are absolutely wonderful because you can start them on box rest, same as the surefoot pads. They can do all the exercises, your core muscles stay strong. Start horses hand walking from the second week on two to three times for five minutes in a walk. Um, and also start them to use the pads more frequently. Um, you can up the working walking time every week by five to seven minutes. Then check after six to eight weeks um, past injuries with ultrasound. Is your plan working? Is the tendon healing? If not, you need to back up with the intensity of your training and also look at other things like, for example, metabolic issues or something like that. If you go on with your training and you have reached one hour of walk, you can back down with the walking time, but add five to seven minutes of trot and up that every week again by five minutes. And then once you have 30 minutes of trot and what's important, do that on a hard first surface first compared to a soft surface where they kind of like use more um, energy and fatigue faster. So um, you overuse the tendon faster. And then once you have 30 minutes of trot, you can reduce trotting time again and add in some canter work. Do it in intervals. That means like you do not more than three minutes of trot in a row. Um, split it up in short bouts of trot, interrupted by walk. And um, there is again that nice little summary in the files from Wendy that Alyssa Harlow from the Humble Hoof did together with me. I gave her the information and she made a very nice summary that you actually can print out 
put some lamination paper over it and hang it in your barn and you have all the information there like really really nicely and with nice visuals like surface time saddle when work in hand when it's really really nicely done um then we're at the next one back problems another very frequent um problem for horses where we often have the tack or the shoeing as an underlying issue you need to make sure they are correct then we can use um Electroacupuncture is really, really nice for that. Or mesotherapy, that means injected with fluid that is anti-inflammatory and also has some painkillers in there. So they can actually relax the muscle, what we do with humans when you inject your back. So you can help with really local inflammation. Um, core exercises like cookie stretches, IQ did, um, also for the tendon injuries. Um, Equiband Equicore system, the sure foot paths are part of the core exercises. Um, equikinetics that I mentioned, like where you do those um, specific um, exercises, like I said, maximum three times a week with alternating days off. Pole walking, um, tail traction is a very nice thing that you can do passively. You can ask your horse. Do you want to lean into it? If the horse says, yes, thank you, do it. If the horse doesn't want to, don't do it. Always ask your horse what they need. Um, massage uh, of big muscle groups or kinesio tape can be used. Um, if you rehabilitate horses with back muscle fatigue, start to work the core muscles first in hand. Later, go on to lunge work where they actually, because in hand you can correct when they kind of cheat. You can use your finger or your body to help them with a short distance to actually do the exercises correctly. On the lunge or further away, the horse needs already a certain ability to know how to correct itself and also the strength to do it. And then later start under saddle leisurely when you go out on trail. Like I said, you can do all the exercising exercises also when you're out on the trail and then go back into arena to do more collected work. As a rule of thumb, the healing process will take as long as it took for the problem to develop. And this is an average of 12 to 18 months if you have a back muscle fatigue that has already set in and you have a hollow back with missing muscles. So we talk about one to one and a half years of rehabilitation till the horses are back to full function. There is no way to shortcut that, um, but it's very rewarding because the horse is really appreciated. Um, from a nutritional point of view, hyaluronic acid, amino acids, vitamin E, and such are very helpful in recovery because they give the muscles what they need um, to grow back. The colic patient, um, you can start cookie stretches immediately when they're still in clinic, same as the short foot pads. Um, start hand walking them the moment they are out of um, sedation and back to eat, to eating, even before that, the movement helps the intestines to come back into, um, into a proper peristaltic movement helps. So walking them several times a day is very beneficial. You can up the walking time five minutes, but here, once we have reached 45 minutes, we add five minutes of trot. Um, once 20 minutes are reached, we start galloping. So you see everything goes faster because we do not have a problem with the tendon injury, but we have an open linea alba or um, work next to it. So we have abdominal muscles that are um, injured. Uh, and that's why it's so important to prevent bucking, rearing up and running around like fools for the first eight weeks, <laughs> because this is when the actual... Um, um, scar can rupture up again because it's not fully healed. So if it's necessary, 
give them some sedatives from ACE or whatever um, to keep them calm enough for that. Uh, turn out not in a big field um, before the eight weeks are over. You can do it in a smaller paddock from week six on if they don't behave like fools. Um, good quality probiotics are always recommended when they had oral antibiotics because oral antibiotics will always mess up your gut um, microbiome and change it. So we need to replace that to prevent um, problems further down the line. Hyaluronic acid and glucosamine probably um, promote tissue healing and diminish complications with scarring. So we get a nice scar tissue that is orientated and not all over the place and develop adhesions or so. This is in addition to movement, one of the most important things for to prevent scar tissue. Um, then the P3 fracture patient, something that unfortunately happens to, there is the most important, that's our bone healing. <laughs> there is the most important that we restrict movement of the hoof capsule, that means expansion and contraction. Barefoot, you can't heal a P3 fracture properly. Please do not try that barefoot. It needs at least a hoof cast that is very, very tight. Because barefoot, we have that extension and contraction, and this is not what the bone needs to heal. So every step, we have a micro movement on the bone that's tearing it apart. They do not heal. It can take years for them to heal if you let them do that. And this is just not fair to let them suffer so long. Mm -hmm. Depending on the fracture, it takes eight to 12 weeks. Um, if it's a wing fracture, it might be done in eight weeks. If we have something into a joint, it might take longer. Um, the, this is a rest period where you do all those passive range of motion things. Sure foot pads are great, cookie stretches, um, proprioceptive input, very little hand walking and hand grazing. So do it slowly, but we have some movement and the horses can be in a little paddock if they don't jump around like crazy. But this is a rest period because we have a broken bone and there is unfortunately nothing that we can do to help it heal. Again, nutrition is really important, either hydrolyzed collagen type one or two or bone gold. I like that one because it also gives um, additional minerals and a lot of collagen is in there. Um, there's a lot of research behind that. Then we have a transition um, period with a supporting shoeing package, for example, like a bar shoe or something like that, or um, just something that gives a little bit more stability, but we do not have anything that restricts, restricts expansion of movement anymore. Just something that it doesn't do this quite a lot. Um, it just gives it a little bit more stability. Um, and then anything, it takes anything from six to 12 months till you can gallop and do whatever you want again, depending on what type of fractures you have had. But the bone itself is very stable, but we have a lot of scar tissue, like I said, the lamina and everything in there that gets injured. So when you're lucky, after half a year, you can go and do your barrel runs again. If you're unlucky, it takes a year. But usually the prognosis is very good if you keep the strict rest at the beginning and prevent the movement. Um, yeah, manual therapy to help with compensations. And like I said from the beginning, on those core muscle exercises that we wrote down, you can do all, all of them and the pads are really, really brilliant for that. So the last one, our laminitic patient, most important rule, one day of active inflammation. That means when you have pulsation and you have to ice the feet and everything, equals one week of rest because we have again, lamina that are injured and ruptured. Um, controlled slow movement is important as the hoof still needs some blood flow. So the strict box rest is not okay, but if you keep them in an opal stable where they can move themselves in and out, or if you do some little hand walk, if they have an ejected paddock where they can move themselves, 
but don't get pushed around by other horses or just have a nice friend with them. That's ideal. They should move, but not under pressure. Um, shoeing and trimming is important. Very short intervals. Usually it's four weeks. Um, X-rays help to check progress. They also tell you, um, do I need a clock? Can I do it? With, um, with a cast, do I need a special shoeing package? This all depends if, the, if it's rotating, if it's sinking, or if it's just inflamed. This, this is really, that's where the X-rays are very helpful to determine what needs doing and how the progress is going on. Venogram is something else when you don't know how bad it is. That means we do some contrast, mid, um, contrast into the veins and then X-ray it. So we can see if there is blood flow at the dorsal part or not, because that's usually where the blood flow is impaired. It's not in the heels, it's in the toes due to the rupture and the rotation. Metabolism and nutrition need to be very well controlled. You can use some anti-inflammatory diet like Dr. Keelan um, promotes that, but important insulin resistant EMS, Cushing's, all that needs to be tested and needs to be under control. Usually laminitis is metabolic if it's not caused by retained placenta or a colitis X or road founder. Everything else is a metabolic issue that needs investigating. Then proprioceptive input. Here we are, we are again with the surefoot pad. We need that slight little movement when they can stand, even in the active phase, it helps with blood flow. And like um, Wendy said, when you do the X-ray then with the blocks that she developed, you can see they align themselves to an angle where they have ideal blood flow and where it's the most comfortable for them. So for these patients, the pads are the most important that you can use. This is the most important um, tool that you can use for rehabilitation of a laminitic patient. You can use them even in the acute phase when they're still sore, they're on painkiller, they need icing, you can put them on the pads and you do them something very nicely. Again, manual therapy to help with compensations, no matter what you choose there. You can also use pulsating magnetic field. You can use laser, whatever helps your horse. Um, what I like is once they're off the anti-inflammatory, um, Yalgulan or Gunostema is a very nice herbal supplement for those patients, because especially when they're metabolic, they all have decreased blood flow, and this helps with that a bit. And last but not least, an injury is not always bad. Um, sometimes we need to look at it a little different because the time you have together with your horse during rehabilitation, when you do cookie stretches or surefoot pads, that's something nice for the horses. They like it and it gives you a very nice connection with them. It's sometimes we just need to change our perspective a little bit. It's shit, we can't ride the horse, but it's also a very good thing if you take the opportunity and make something good out of it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> I, Martina, what a thorough and clear presentation. Um, uh, in fact, that's that are exactly the com. Um, Becky Tenja says, once again, Martina, I'm blown away by the vastness of your knowledge. You are brilliant. You have given a master class in rehab topics. Thank you for the gift of your knowledge. And I totally agree. I mean, there's no questions because you've covered everything so thoroughly and so completely. And uh, this is just fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. You're very welcome. That's something I love to do. And you know, it's so important. And it's the little things that you can do at home that make enormous progress for your horses and really look at it as a as an opportunity to do something good and to connect with your horse even more. And then it's very rewarding. I had my last horse was a case like that, that nobody else wanted to have anymore. And we had three years of rehab where I couldn't ride him because he was in such a bad state when I took him over. And afterwards, I had an absolutely lovely horse that would do everything for me. And that's, that's just how it is. It might take long, but it's absolutely worth it. Yeah. Um, so 
Um, thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, what is today? Thursday? Yes. yes. I, I've lost track of time. That's one thing about being home for a year. I've totally lost track of time. Um, <laughs> Um, tomorrow we'll do the Surefoot at one o'clock. Join me then to learn more about how to use the pads, which Martina has so clearly indicated for so many of these rehab conditions. And um, have a great day. Thank you again, Martina. It was brilliant. And we really appreciate your time sharing us with us today. All the best. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. Bye.